All right, hello, my name is Jeremy Antley, and I'm a committee member and treasurer for Theorizing the Web. And I'm very excited today to bring you today's invited panel, Get Ready for Some Gaming Theory. Now we got that out of our system, right? All right, good. <laughs> I want to start with a brief overview and then introduce our wonderful panelists today. The famous mathematician Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz once wrote to a friend that, quote, people are more inventive in games than anywhere else. And he later amended his phrase to say, people are most inventive when creating games. Uh, Leibniz always carried with him a secret predilection for game study, a topic considered in his heyday, the late, uh, 16th and er or the late 17th and early 18th centuries, to be beneath the dignity of serious scholarly intent. Nonetheless, Leibniz pursued his interest, going so far as to utilize in 1710 the inaugural magazine issue of the Berlin Academy he founded to outline an epistemology of games. In the article, he discussed three examples, the newly invented game of Solitaire, a game of Leibniz's own design that modeled ship maneuvers, and an illustration of which depicted play of what we now call Go. The last example intrigued Leibniz, who noted that the winner of Go was the one who took the freedom of movement from the other, quote, without murder and blood. He continued, adding that, quote, though this is not uncommon in other games, it is compulsory here. It is known that the peoples of Southeast Asia behave in this manner in, so to speak, a more Christian fashion than those who call themselves Christians, and as a rule avoid killing specifically in war. Orientalist notions aside, Leibniz believed that games could help reveal the inner qualities and characteristics of those that designed and played them. One of Leibniz's maxims, cum deus calculat fit mundus, was translated by Martin Heidegger to mean, while God plays, the world comes to be. While Leibniz never explicitly stated it, what he sought to understand was the threshold space facilitated by the creation and playing of games. Within this threshold space, perspective of identity come to the fore, perspectives brought by player and designer alike. Even though it has been 300 years since Leibniz first, Leibniz first proposed his epistemology of games, we are still debating in popular and academic forums alike the role games play in the formation of culture and identity as well as how games become vehicles of expression and formulation of taste through their mechanical design or capacity to create both affective and effective narratives. The panel gathered today will explore the threshold space created by games through a variety of perspectives. Topics include discussing the oft-used concept of the magic circle, but with an actual emphasis on how magic circles used in witchcraft allow us to understand the multiplicities of play spaces and identifications that players construct. There's also the issue of how games, straddling the divide between actual objects and fictional worlds, creates a tension between the vision of designers and the expectations of players in negotiating the ideal form of such games. Beyond magic circles and ideal forms is the act of exiting games themselves, a process put into comparative shade next to the bright light often focused on tutorials and maintaining play loops for sustained engagement. Here we turn to Turkish baths and the rituals of aftercare in the S&M community alike, for insight on how we detach from the threshold space of games and re-enter our daily lives. Finally, we'll discuss the popular and growing presence of streamers on Twitch or YouTube, streamers whose play turn labor must occupy the threshold space between player, public relations, and entertainer. But first, let me introduce our guest today. Austin Walker is editor-in-chief of Vice's portal covering games and games culture, Waypoint. There's Austin. Hello. Before that, he wrote and edited for Paste and Giant Bomb, and has, for as long as I can remember, uh, always been killing it on his Twitter feed. He also just recently had Rob Zachney join the Waypoint staff, something I personally want to say thumbs up to. That's, that was great. Naomi Clark is a professor at NYU Game Center and an independent game designer whose works include Mismanagement and Consentical. Did I, did I pronounce that right? Good. Okay. One of the more inventive designers working today, Naomi is also inspiring the next generation to tackle more personal and culturally relevant issues in their own game designs. Mike Thompson is a writer, and a pretty good one, that has worked great the sites of New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New Inquiry, Real Life Mag, and so many others. Back when I first wrote my first essay for The New Inquiry about the Cold War board game Twilight Struggle in 2012, Mike was one of the few writers I also noticed that submitted other games essays, and I'm really excited to have him here talking with us today. And finally, but certainly not last, is Stephanie Jennings, is a PhD student from the Rensselaer, I'm so bad at this, it's RPI, is all I've heard of it. Rensselaer. Rensselaer, there we go. Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, a really great name, uh, whose research focuses on the intersection between video games, horror, gender, and witchcraft. Stephanie has been in high demand this conference season, and we're really excited to have her here for TTW17. And without further ado, we're going to have, uh, I believe, Mike kick off our sessions for us. No, we traded off. Oh, we traded. Oh, nice. I'm going to go first. Now Amy's going to start. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, let's see if we can uh, 
get this PowerPoint up and running, I guess if I hit play. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so hi, I'm Naomi, and I'm gonna preface this by, by saying that I, uh, although I'm a professor at NYU, I am not an academic. I, I barely have any degrees. I spent uh, most of my life making games uh, professionally and also as a hobby. Uh, so I, I come at uh, the questions that we're engaging with today from a point of view of practice and design, and I really consider myself an art teacher more than anything. Uh, so I wanted to kick this off uh, by talking uh, about the peculiar nature of games uh, and the way they've been described by uh, theorist Jesper Yule uh, as half real. That they are, they're both fictional and they, they take place somehow in the real world. Uh, and that this kind of collision between the imagined nature of what's going on in games and then the fact that there are actual humans enacting these things uh, creates all sorts of interesting frictions. Uh, so to get at what Jesper Yule is talking about, uh, let's take a, a popular game like Street Fighter, uh, here represented by Street Fighter V. So in Street Fighter V, there are uh, these two guys, Ken and Ryu, a, uh, a white guy and an Asian guy. They've both studied sort of similar forms of martial arts. They sort of grew up as, as rivals, and they sort of continue to battle uh, in the world of Street Fighter V. Uh, but of course, Ken and Ryu are not just fictional characters in a story world. Uh, they also are components of uh, game software with a set of carefully tweaked numbers that defines each of them and their capabilities. Uh, they have certain actions and moves that they can do, and this sort of sets them up as, as parts of a strategic space where players are sort of deciding first which character they're going to play and then what they're going to do as those characters, right? And then if we step one layer further back from this, of course, then these two characters who are also components of game software are then piloted by actual humans who are also rivals in the real world, right? Um, so here you have, you know, Lupe Fiasco, a, uh, a celebrity in the music world, uh, facing off against Daigo Umehara, whose name you may not recognize, but uh, for fighting game aficionados, he's sort of one of the biggest celebrities from that world. Uh, and they're rivals in an actual social situation, right? So when Yule is talking about uh, games being half real, uh, he sees the, the rules component and the decisions humans are making with those rules as the real part. So there's a real, albeit playful, conflict happening between these two humans, uh, but there's also this fictional conflict happening up on a screen that all these people are looking at. Uh, and it's happening for the millionth time between these two characters, Ken and Yu, who are always sort of fighting within this world. Uh, but one of the things that Yule doesn't really address in, uh, in his work Half Real uh, is that fictional worlds also, are, you could look at them as being composed of an immense number of rules. That's sort of what make, makes them feel internally consistent, uh, lets audience members sort of imagine what might happen next, or you know, would this character really do this or that? Uh, does it make sense for, for Hermione to grow up and marry Ron Weasley, or do you, like, are you fiercely opposed to that as uh, some you know, online uh, shippers are to, to the... Uh, uh, Hermione Ron pairing and you think that you know Hermione should have ended up with Harry Potter instead uh, And so people are imme immensely invested in those rules. They're supposed to make sense at some level uh, And like the rules of games, they're kind of considered a social contract for those who care about them Whether you're an author creating these worlds or an audience member sort of partaking of them and then sort of maybe extending them with your own fan works or imagination and breaking them has some social consequences for that, we, uh, to see an example, we don't need to look too much farther than the current state of Marvel Comics, uh, where author Nick Spencer has come under fire from a large segment of the, uh, the Marvel Comics fan base for making Captain America into a secret agent of the, uh, of the International Terrorist Association Hydra, which, uh, as you may know, has sort of roots in Nazi Germany. And so a lot of people thought this was just beyond the pale to make uh, Captain America storied uh, American fighter against uh, the fascist menace uh, into a secret fascist himself. Uh, it was maybe for some people a little bit too real, other, for other people uh, just uh, unspeakably offensive and potentially even anti-Semitic. Uh, so there was a, a disrupture, a rupture here between what fans thought made sense uh, as an extension of this ongoing universe that's been evolving for many decades, and what the direction that the author, Nick Spencer, wanted to take sort of as a, as a provocation, or sort of playing a game of chicken with the audience to see, like, can you handle this next plot twist? 
Uh, but for a lot of audience members, it just didn't make sense. And this is something, of course, authors have been grappling with for a long time. The idea that, well, it's a fictional world. Is it supposed to be logical? Are you supposed to feel like it's realistic or sensible? So you, you, know, you don't have to go very far before you find a lot of quotes on this subject by various famous, famous authors, uh, especially you know, for some reason around the, the turn of the 20th century, but uh, later on as well, talking about, well, you know, fiction is actually held to a higher standard, maybe in some ways, than reality since the, the real world is much more strange than we could imagine, uh, these fictional rules, they come out of a somewhat logical process, and they're evaluated in this logical way. Um, but games have even more problems than this uh, that stem in part from their half-real status. Uh, they tend to have systems and rules and players trying to take action within those systems, whether those systems are representing uh, falling blocks, as in an abstract game like Tetris, or what's imagined to be a living, breathing city full of commuters and workers and families in, in games like SimCity. Uh, and SimCity has come under a lot of criticism over the years, although it's a beloved game. People have pointed out that the logic of SimCity, the original game from back in the 80s, kind of feels more like Southern California than anywhere else in terms of, its, of the city's relationship to water and how people are traveling around it uh, and in considerations of residential areas and pollution and so forth. And the, uh, the most recent iteration of SimCity shown here uh, was uh, the first one in which homelessness was modeled. So before, just a few years ago, there was no such thing as homelessness in any SimCity. The simulation just didn't extend that far, right? Because there's a point at which simulation kind of ends. The, you know, the map is not the, ter is not the actual terrain, right? Uh, and here's, a, here's an example of what homelessness looks like in SimCity. It's represented by a ton of little yellow figures. Each of these figures is one, is one homeless person. Uh, and it became a dilemma, something that was hotly debated within the, the community of SimCity players. Like, how do, you, how do you deal with this problem? What's the solution? What's the game strategy to try and, uh, how to get rid of the homeless people? Because the, uh, the interesting thing was that this, uh, the lead designer of this game, Stone LeBrandy, did not build in uh, a solution, some uh, way that you could figure out to, to sort of address the problem of homelessness, or to even actually maybe even create uh, homes for homeless people. Uh, and he's gone on the record as saying that this was because he could not find any solution in the real world that he, he felt had been demonstrated to actually be effective, so therefore that he could include in the model. Right? So his design practice was a little bit like, okay, let's look back at what's established as really working or ha what, what cause and effect are in terms of cities, and that's what he's going to put in and no further. Right? So, uh, in part, this opens up a door for players to maybe find their own solutions. And uh, a lot of these solutions or approaches or questions were gathered uh, by uh, Matteo Batonti in a volume that he called How to Get Rid of Homelessness. And the, the, the red text in red here is a quote from that compilation of people talking about homelessness in SimCity uh, in vexed ways, right? Like, oh, how do, how do I get rid of these people? How do they ship them out? Uh, and what's interesting here is that SimCity is functioning not as a depiction of reality or you know, simulating or showing how homelessness really works in the real world as much as it is uh, displaying for all of us the cultural attitude and logic, uh, in Matteo Batonti's words, the sort of the neoliberal logic that surrounds and tries to manage the idea of homelessness. Right? So how do we as a culture or the, your sort of typical game player think about homelessness? We can see it on display in that work. Uh, and so there's always a tension between players wanting a simulation, what's represented to be more realistic, and players not wanting things to be as realistic as they might be if you, if you sort of start to partially put in a system like homelessness. Um, the, the push for more realism, I think, uh, came on display pretty recently with the launch of a game called uh, Mass Effect Andromeda, which was attacked ferociously online by a lot of people who bought the game, uh, as well as, as gaming news outlets, for uh, having faces and animations of, th of the characters' faces in the games that, that felt like they fell into an uncanny valley. Like you, you, the idea that you were interacting with some kind of living, breathing human, uh, when of course these are partially portrayed by a motion capped and voice recorded uh, actor. But the, uh, the face and facial expressions felt stiff, wooden, like a mannequin or a robot. And so it sort of disrupted this feeling of realism. And uh, yeah, so this is maybe one of the, the things that we see most often in the game industry, that games start to, to suffer in their review scores, which in turn affect sales. 
that uh, they're, they're failing at, at creating a, a living, breathing reality. Uh, and it's not just, uh, we're not just talking about 3D models, of course. There are also debates at this edge of what's simulated and what's not that uh, uh, in systems like prisons, right? So introversion software, the creators of this game, Prison Architect, they decided very deliberately to draw a strong line around what they were going to simulate in this game. And just to, be, just to note, this is not a game that's meant to be lighthearted or fun uh, when it comes to prisons. It's trying to take the issue seriously and sort of represent what are the things that someone managing an actual prison has to think about, whether it's uh, for the goals of money or trying to uh, actually create a, a better environment for incarcerated people, but they, they left out certain things that they felt were just too uh, much of a hot button political issue. And that includes racism and sexual assault, just don't exist in these prisons. Uh, although, you know, you can have riots, there's all sorts of content that attempts to be rather gritty. Uh, there are inmates from different ethnic backgrounds. There are even people who are noted in their files are in prison for rape. But those elements, they affect nothing else in the simulation. They're like disconnected wires. They, uh, they don't actually affect how anyone relates to each other or what happens in the prison. And so a lot of heated arguments among players ensued about, you know, well, should this have been in, in the simulation or not? Uh, and it was seen as a potential intrusion of politics into games, something that a certain segment of consumers playing games are kind of resent that they don't want a certain type of realism intruding if it reminds them too much of, of political issues that are being debated in the rest of the world. So there's a, a, a pushback as well uh, as a desire for more realism in different ways. And we can kind of see in the logic of these systems, because they're incomplete, they, they tend towards uh, a, t a, a type of representation that's actually completely alien to the world as we know it. And maybe that's best seen in projects like Magna Santi, which was built uh, using SimCity 2000. It's an attempt to create what uh, SimCity 2000 considers to be the most optimal perfect city imaginable. So and it ends up becoming a perfectly regulated totalitarian nightmare. It's a, a depiction of the relentless logic of SimCity's systems of play and fun carried to an extreme that's both absurd but also terrifyingly logical. And we can see similar things uh, in games like DayZ, uh, one of the leaders of a genre of survival games that's become more and more popular in recent years, where you can die of hunger, thirst, you can break your limbs. It's also very harshly realistic in that way. But uh, true to the genre of zombie apocalypse that it's depicting, human beings in this world are the greatest threat. And uh, DayZ became chiefly known as a kind of amoral playground where better armed players are tying up and torturing weaker players for fun, usually by making them drink disinfectant, which is one of the things that the, the game system allows. And so rather than representing some kind of actual uh, CDC outbreak scenario that we might imagine or see it represented in other media, uh, DayZ comes closest to, to depicting a, a kind of a, a fantasy similar to Lord of the Flies, where the, the strong are constantly preying on the weak. And uh, I want to wrap up by talking about one last form of, of edge uh, that where, where simulations leave off. And that's the, the edge of the, the virtual spaces that are represented in games. Um, in Grand Theft Auto, there's a tradition of certain areas of the world not being accessible to players. And there are often bridges or construction barricades set up so that players can't proceed any further. Uh, if the player does somehow manage to make their way beyond these boundaries, because in the complexity of code, many things are possible, the, uh, the, the wanted level of the player shoots up to six stars. It's really one of the, the, the most severe crimes that you can commit in a game that's all about crime. Uh, almost instantly, just by trespassing, uh, you, you become subjected to tanks and, and helicopters and SWAT vehicles, the kind of things that in the rest of the game world, you'd have to sort of blow up a lot of cops in order to, to sort of become that notorious of a criminal. Similarly, uh, in games like Crisis uh, that take place on, on an island, if you try to leave the island, if you swim out, you are attacked by an enormous ferocious shark. So the borders of these worlds are being patrolled by ferocious enemies. Uh, Activision Blizzard um, in the game World of Warcraft, one of the most popular mul massively multiplayer games of all time, uh, had a practice of, of 
having a, a gigantic fearsome demon show up if players went into areas where they were not supposed to be, which would instantly kill you. This tradition goes back to the 80s uh, in games like Space Quest, where like a giant worm emerges from the desert to eat you if you, if you set foot outside the bounds. But what, what's exactly going on here as these borders are being patrolled? Why are our developers so anxious to sort of keep players within, within the, uh, the magic circle, which we'll actually sort of get back to later? Uh, and I see it as actually protecting players from something harsher, something worse than a giant shark or a glowing green demon. And, and that's this. It's, it's the harshness of, of reality that uh, you are actually playing a video game and that if you step outside of the area that's been allocated for you, you will fall endlessly through a void, which is in fact what will happen in a lot of games if you step outside of the area that's been sort of carefully constructed and tested for you, you just fall endlessly into nothingness. So that's, that's the horror of what's actually going on here. It's the canvas beneath the paint, right? That this is all a sort of empty digital space. And, and actually this looks a lot like what, you know, what the software looks like when you're playing, when you're building a game. It's an empty white canvas, right? And the, but players have to be protected from that. Protected from the knowledge that you know, they might, in, this, in the same game, this is from Assassin's Creed Unity, uh, this cute little French girl is, is actually a mass of partially constructed virtual organs. And this is a glitch that appeared in that game. Um, and was, so these types of glitches are both reviled and again, sort of criticized in games, and sort of maybe leading to lower, lower review scores or a lot of angry fans. But then uh, they're also sought after or collected or, or put on YouTube for entertainment because they're both hilarious and they sort of expose the, the sort of underlying nature of games. Uh, so I think this is something that we want to keep in mind, the, the disconnect between reality and, and what's portrayed in games. The fact that games are, they are not uh, exact simulations, right? They're not, they're not even really trying to be. They're more of the nature of simulacra, right? They are a little bit divorced from reality. They're starting to sort of drift off in their own realm and they have all of these weird quirks that can't help but bubble out, like a, like a interjection that you can't help but say. And that's important to keep in mind, I think, in a time when uh, the United Nations is spending a huge amount of money to sort of create empathy virtual reality experiences, which are predicated on the idea that, yeah, if we, if we create a virtual digital 3D experience, or we put some video and like expose it to you in a you know, visually surrounded kind of way, that it's going to be somehow so true to life. It's going to be a, a real representation of, of what someone's experience is like that we will be moved by it in a way that somehow we wouldn't be if we were just to watch a documentary or, or even hear that people were suffering. Uh, so I'm going to, to leave it there. I think I'm a little bit over time and turn it over to our next speaker. Thanks very much. So I'm going to be dealing with a pretty contentious topic in the field of game studies called the magic circle. Uh, put really simply, the magic circle presumably declares that there's a boundary that separates spaces of play from those of ordinary life. It's come under really intense criticism over the last 15 years or so to the point that uh, a number of game scholars have said that we should just get rid of the concept entirely and stop talking about it. Um, in fact, I'm aware of the possibility that there might be some game studies folks out there in the audience hearing me say that I'm going to be talking about the magic circle and cringing and rolling their eyes and thinking, here we go, another graduate student talking about the magic circle and gearing up to take it down again. Uh, but that's not what I want to do today. Um, instead, uh, what I hope to do with this presentation is to propose a way that we can start to reconceptualize this concept to make it both useful and political. Uh, I want to use the magic circle to better understand how it is that players construct and negotiate their spaces of play while also incorporating, occupying, and asserting particular subject positions in video games. Uh, and to do so, I want to reconsider the magic circle as magic circles in the witchcraft sense of the term. Um, so I, I think it's pretty important, uh, as is typical in conversations of the magic circle, uh, to discuss its origins uh, so that we know uh, exactly where uh, it came from and why we're still talking about it. Um, the term magic circle first appeared in the 1930s in the book Homo Ludens by anthropologist Johann Heisinger. Um, but Heisinger only used the phrase a handful of times. 
Um, and he never really called any special attention to it or expressly attached it to any particular fl uh, fleshed out theory. Uh, it's not particularly prominent in Homo ludens. Um, in fact, in the most famous and well-cited passage that mentions the magic circle, magic circle is only one of many examples in a list of different types of playgrounds. Uh, the passage states, quote, the arena, the card table, the magic circle, the temple, the stage, the screen, the tennis court, the court of justice, etc., are all in form and function playgrounds. That is forbidden spots, isolated, hedged round, hallowed, within which special rules obtain. All are temporary worlds within which or within the ordinary world, dedicated to the performance of an act apart. But it was with Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman's book Rules of Play that the magic circle emerges as a specific concept in the field of game studies. In Rules of Play, Salen and Zimmerman ask questions like, what does it mean to enter the system of game? How is it that a play begins and ends? What makes up the boundary of the game? They use the magic circle to answer these questions, characterizing the play of video games as a space with its own rules, specific localities and durations, and meanings. So the simplest and most common visualization of the magic circle is a line of chalk on the ground. A chalk circle can delineate a space where certain rules and meanings apply. Uh, it designates a realm of play that is bounded off from the space of ordinary life around it. Uh, the game takes place within the circle. If you go outside the circle, you're out of bounds of the game and you're either in violation of the rules or you're no longer playing. Uh, another way of visualizing this is something like a sports stadium. Um, so within the locality of the stadium uh, in the designated time of a game, uh, something like a football isn't just a meaningless object but becomes a way to score points. Um, there are rules for who can interact with that football, when they can interact with it, how, can they, how they can interact with it, uh, and what that football means at any given time. Um, Oops, I skipped something, sorry. <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, so many game scholars have interpreted these, visu these visualizations of the magic circle um, as, as indicating that uh, spaces in play of play and non-play can be easily separated from one another. Um, they believe that the magic circle signifies a closed system of play that the ordinary world does not and cannot infringe upon. Um, so this, this notion, these assumptions, are where a great deal of the objections to the magic circle come from. So, now we can get to this. Uh, in, in a Gama Sutra article in 2012, uh, Eric Zimmerman responded to criticisms of the magic circle, uh, arguing that many critiques had established a straw man to debate against. Uh, and he called that straw man the magic circle jerk. Uh, the magic circle jerk had uh, taken a firm, oppressive stance on the magic circle. Uh, they had declared that video games are formal structures that are totally separate from ordinary life. No aspects of lived experience can intrude on the game space. This jerk also privileged the rules of the game over the experiences of play, ripping games and play out of any cultural or social context. But there was no magic circle jerk. Uh, so no one, including Heisinga or Salen or Zimmerman, had ever said any of those things, uh, but game studies had worked itself up into a furor about it and had set fire to this straw man that it had created. Um, but in the ongoing debates against the magic circle jerk, uh, we definitely learned a number of really crucial points about video games and spaces of play uh, that scholars have uh, underscored and reinforced. Um, so this is definitely an oversimplification, but I want to point to three particularly pertinent ideas that came out of the, these uh, debates. The first one is that play is never wholly separate from uh, ordinary life. Outside knowledge and experience shape experiences of play. The second is that players negotiate the boundaries of game and play spaces. And the third is that spaces of play are culturally contextual and socially formed. Um, in order to reframe the magic circle in light of these principles, a number of game study scholars have suggested other visualizations of the magic circle. Uh, so these have included things like porous circles and nets uh, that are still kind of bounded off spaces but have holes in them so that real life can like get in and out. Uh, or something like a puzzle piece, which is what Jesper Yule suggests, uh, which is still kind of bounded off but uh, is shaped differently to fit into different kinds of contexts. Um, or there have been plenty of game scholars that have suggested that we just get rid of it entirely, like I said earlier, and just like quit talking about the magic circle entirely. Um, but I think that the magic circle can be valuable for understanding those social, cultural, and political contexts of play and how players craft meaning within those contexts. Uh, what I think that the magic circle needs is a reframing. Um, so, to both build on and move away from these previous debates, I want to try to conceptualize the magic circle as a magic circle. Uh, hang on just a second. But let me provide some context for what I mean here. Um, my research largely deals with the idea uh, that players are parts of, uh, the part of the texts of games. And if players are parts of game texts, then so too are their actions, experiences, and subject positions. Um, I'm especially interested in examining the ways that experiences from gendered intersectional subject positions shape and influence players' experiences of video games and the meanings that their play generates. 
So much of my research is on horror games in particular. Uh, specifically, I've been looking at how horror games that may seem like masculine power fantasies can actually be experienced by women players as opportunity for sub opportunities for subversive performances of femininity. Um, these performances may have the effect of, for instance, turning a game that may seem misogynistic in its design into embodied experiences uh, that allow women to challenge uh, traditional notions of femininity and even tear down patriarchy. Uh, and because I'm looking at horror games, I'm using the figure of the witch as a metaphor for such defiant feminine subjectivities. Uh, so for me, the magic circle wit uh, makes more sense when contextualized within uh, myths of witchcraft, though as a disclaimer, I'm definitely not going for some sort of historical accuracy here with regard to uh, ritual practices. I'm just thinking about this figuratively um, as coming out of my interest in witches as pop cultural icons. Um, so let's think about the magic circle as uh, a space that witches draw from which to cast spells. Uh, magic circles are contingent on the ordinary world, not apart from it. Uh, this, in some senses, they definitely do follow Heisinger's notion of temporary worlds within the ordinary world. In some regards, they may be thought of as portals that connect to other planes of existence, but these other planes of existence are also not separate, but are entangled and enmeshed and contextualized within ordinary life. Magic circles rely on the connections that witches make between those worlds and their contextualizations separately and in relation to one another. They enable witches to perform particular spells, to craft or summon particular entities, and to engage with other dimensions of being, while also still being rooted in their own existence. Using the magic circle this way calls attention to the fact that the magic circle isn't just a formal boundary around a pre-existing set of rules, or that gives access to an objective, untouchable world. It's something that the witch has to cast, or that a group of witch, uh, witches cast together. There may be conventions guiding the casting, but it's ultimately up to the witch to cast the spell. So it's ultimately up to players, then, to draw their magic circles and summon gaming worlds into being. So I think it could be useful to deploy the magic circle not as that magic circle jerk notion of a, a solidly bounded off space, but instead as a way of actually understanding how players construct and negotiate space of play. Casting a magic circle, can this be a metaphor for how players negotiate game and play spaces? With this concept, we can start asking questions like what kinds of magic circles are players casting? What kinds of game spaces do those circles create? What do players incorporate into those spaces or try to bar out? But even if players try to set up barriers, their magic circles can be intruded upon and threatened. There may be disruptions from the ordinary world or threats from other worlds with which the caster may be trying to connect, or from the spell itself, or from other casters. A witch player might not always know what, uh, what precisely it is they're summoning within their magic circles. So a common critique that's uh, usually directed against the magic circle jerk is the notion that the magic circle privileges form, structure, and design in ways that oppress and restrict players' activities and experiences. According to the magic circle jerk, rules take precedence. Consequently, the magic circle jerk uh, stifles conversation about transgressive play practices. But by reconceptualizing the magic circle as a magic circle, I want to suggest that we can actually better get at how gameplay can be an appropriative act. These magic circles can start to more richly reveal players' varying play styles and practices, how play is performative and embodied, and how players make meaning in their engagements with video games and from the perspectives of particular subject positions. Thus, I think a better title for this presentation may be Casting Magic Circles, plural, rather than Recasting the Magic Circle. The approach that I'm suggesting can start to reveal multiplicities of magic circles, multiplicities of play practices, and multiplicities of subjectivities, rather than treating the magic circle as a fixed, rigid boundary. Magic circles can reveal how the experiences of, and knowledges from players' subject positions can transform the meanings of their play. So to conclude, while the magic circle has typically been understood as a concept for game design, we can redeploy it to better account for player experiences. Magic circles matter because they can serve political purposes, illuminating the ways that players' subjectivities, identities, and the contexts of their lived experiences entangle within the contexts of gaming worlds. While this may not be how play spaces work for all video games at all times, in all places, and for all players, I think it could be one possible way of thinking about how players may approach play and generate meaning within their playful activities. Thank you. Hey everybody, let me get my slides up, which are much less impressive. You know how that goes, I'm sure. Especially when I, I grab the PDF instead of the uh, the correct, uh, what do you call it? I can live with this though. It's not the end of the world. Let me see if I can. Uh, yeah. I'm 
gonna, I'm gonna do the, the thing of just literally bringing my slides over here and then buttoning through them. What'll happen? Uh, go back here. Maybe not lose stuff. All right. Hey everybody, I'm Austin Walker. Uh, I am the editor-in-chief of waypoint.vice.com, where we try to figure out how and why people play through editorial coverage, videos, and a bunch of other things. Before that, I was at giantbomb.com, which is a, a, a video game journalism website with lots of video coverage, lots of live streams. And before that, I was an academic who was hypercritical of video coverage and live streams, uh, and who got interested in them, then started doing them, and then found a career, and eventually wound up here. Um, so the thing that I actually really love about Stephanie's talk just now, if I can, if I can steal from it, um, not just the, the question of the magic circle, but the, the uh, analogy of a stadium. Uh, I want you to imagine a stadium where there is a game being played, football, soccer, baseball, whatever. Um, take that in your head and imagine that it's going as normal and everything's happening according to the rules that you have in mind. And then bit by bit, play spills off field and suddenly the coach is a player. Uh, and then the water boy is a player, and then the people in the lower stands are players too, uh, and some of them are paid and some of them are not, and then the concession worker is a player, and then bit by bit the stadium grows and grows and grows like this like surreal, <coughs> magical, realist monster until the entire city is part of the stadium. That is what I believe is happening with live streaming and Twitch specifically. So an introduction to people who don't know Twitch. Um, Twitch is... My slides are cut off and bad because I brought in the PDF instead of the, the keynote. Apologies. Um, the uh, Twitch is a site that you can go to live stream video games on. Uh, you go home with the new Mass Effect game, uh, as Naomi mentioned, and say, hey, this game looks really goofy. I'm going to play it in front of uh, you know, thousands of other people. Uh, and in doing so, create uh, a little bit of entertainment for me, my friends, my audience. Um, the original use of this was, you know, this, this grew out of Justin TV, which was founded 10 years ago in 2007, and then in 2014 was shuttered because Justin TV was focused on real life, was focused on, on sharing, uh, you know, just footage of the real world and you're walking about doing your day. But what really took off was people sitting in their rooms, looking at a webcam, playing video games. Um, recently, they've gone back into real life because this is the way of capitalism, is once you've kind of hit all of your targets, you have to find new targets to hit. Uh, and currently there are 100 million active users on the site. Uh, the other stats got cut off, but I know them. Uh, Two million uh, of which are streamers, or people who actually sit in front of the camera and play games and stream them, or do other things and stream them. Uh, and of those two million streamers, 17,000 are partnered, which means that they can monetize their content. Which means that 199 million, or sorry, uh, 1.9 million people are streaming uh, and they're not being not able to monetize their content, uh, and the vast majority of people who interact with Twitch are not able to uh, or do not engage with it as streamers at all, but only as spectators. So again, here is a crunched slide, but I know this stuff. So uh, in 2014, I got to speak with uh, uh, Matthew Di Di Pietro, who at the time was the VP of Marketing at Twitch. Uh, and his arguments for why people did this should sound familiar to anyone who has worked in the, the creative sector of the internet for a long time, which is people do this because they like to do it. It's a passion project. It's like blogging. It's just like, you know, doing art on the side. It's only so that they can show it to their friends and family and, and completely dismissed uh, the notion that there was an economic interest in any way. Uh, at the time, Twitch had blossomed over the last year for a really important reason. Up until 2014, the way that you got to stream games on Twitch was you went to the store and bought a computer, and then you went to the store again and bought a very expensive piece of hardware called a capture card that let you capture incoming data from a video game console, or else you played PC games, which, you know, PCs are very expensive to build uh, and, and sometimes difficult to build, especially then. Then in 2013, at the end of 2013, the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One launched, and those both had Twitch built in. And within a year, Twitch saw a jump from 500 million active users to, uh, or sorry, from 500,000 active users to 1 million active streamers. Uh, and then since then, that number has doubled again to 2 million active streamers. Um, I will note that in the same conversation with Matthew DiPietro, I also got to speak with their community manor, uh, manager, Jordan Tare, who said, for a lot of broadcasters, the dream is to make money playing video games, straight up, to be honest. 
was really good because he wasn't in the early part of that conversation. He like was in a different room and then came in and I tossed him like a real easy softball about just what is it like being a community manager? And after the other two guys I've been interviewing, like no one wants to make money. He literally walked in the room and was like, I'm going to be straight with you. It's about dollars. <laughs> so, um, and now in 2017, there has been another change um, in which, or another, another series of changes. One I've already discussed, uh, Twitch IRL, which is this move back towards uh, real life streaming. You can't read any of these, but this is like someone doing ASMR, which is a, a type of video content where someone speaks very quietly to you like this and it gives you kind of brain tingles. Uh, cooking, people uh, doing uh, tea talk, um, people walking down the street for coffee time, etc. And then the other major change this year has been this, which is really the precipice of what I think Twitch's future is. And for me, the, this is part of working through what, the, what players are negotiating, what their roles are in the larger sphere of video games right now. Uh, I won't redo this press release, but the, the quick and dirty of it is Twitch had previously been just a live streaming uh, uh, kind of destination. You went to watch people play games. Twitch was acquired uh, for lots of money by Amazon a few years ago. Amazon is, of course, a retail uh, giant, and they like to sell things. And so now, if you are a Twitch streamer, there are a number of games that you can sell directly to your audience, uh, which you get a cut of. Um, Thankfully, it's, that means that, again, this is only the 17,000 uh, uh, partnered people can do this. The remaining 2 million cannot. Um, and they get 5% of that, of that sale, which, which means that they're incentivized to play games and to talk them up and sell them, right? You've, you've now moved from player to streamer, from streamer to marketer. Um, and from there, this is the thing that I kind of, this is where I want to get back to, which is in 2007, when people first kind of hacked Justin TV to allow you to play stream, to play games on stream. The, the space there was contentious, but pretty clear. You were playing a game for an audience because you wanted to be watched playing a game. Uh, you wanted to play a game with your friends and family. Uh, Naomi and I would say, hey, let's start a SimCity playthrough. We're gonna check out what the, what the new patch does and see what happens there that's, that's neat. Uh, and then, as the years continued, as the, the market realized that this was a way to, to make money, as Twitch realized that this was much more profitable than, than just showing people walk down the street, they began to invest not only in uh, a back end that allowed people to do this more easily, but in partnerships with companies like Microsoft and Sony. In a way, converting people who would traditionally go to a store, buy a game, come home, sit down and play it, into people who would be marketers for the game product, and also content creators for Twitch. This is the threshold that I'm interested in. At, one, at what point is it that the player uh, is, is, that the, the play experience uh, has been uh, moved from inside of this magic circle where it is, in some regards, protected act, right? It, this is something that's separate from, from your traditional labor work. This is something that you go to, to work and you, and you bust your ass all day and you come home and you really wanna play Mass Effect to uh, an activity that you do because you align it with labor in your own head, with something that you want to go do because it could be another source of income, because it could be your, new, your big break. And more and more, the thing that gets blurred about, about this, the, the, the threshold grows, is that play itself transforms because this becomes the new, these become the new rules of play. One of the like, stories you hear more and more uh, from, from parents, or at least I have, as someone who receives letters from parents telling me what their, their kids do, is, you know, eight, nine, ten-year-olds sit down to play Minecraft, and their parents overhear them speaking with a British accent, describing the things they are doing. And they do this because that's how they think Minecraft is played, because they're used to watching British people play Minecraft on YouTube and Twitch. The, their actual play practice has been affected by their uh, con consumption. And, like, this is the other thing, is that as uh, players, there are more and more people who don't sit down and play the game of SimCity and encounter the homelessness question, or who uh, don't play DayZ uh, and see the, the kind of torturous things that happen there. They only watch them. And there is now this other fourth identity that we need to really investigate. What is the, this increasing number of spectator as game ingester, right? Like, more, if, if 200 million people use this platform just as, as their nightly entertainment, 
how does that map to what we already assume maps, you know, with, with sports uh, uh, viewers, with people who watch, you know, chess, with people who watch traditional games? What does that identity uh, look like? Uh, and the thing that, that to me makes this all the most interesting is that it's all basically working on a wink and a nod. This week, this past week, uh, Sega, which is a company that owns another company named Atlas, you probably know Sega from Sonic the Hedgehog, who doesn't? Um, they also own a company called Atlas that released a new RPG, a new role-playing game called Persona 5. And when that released here in North America, they released a thing saying, no one's allowed to stream this game past a certain point in the game, past a fairly early certain point. And for me, that was an important reminder that all of this works because the game companies look at Twitch and they say, mm, we think we're getting more value out of this from individual players than we are losing. For the, the publisher of Persona 5, they said, well, the big draw here is the story content of this game. If people are going to watch this thing for free, we, we, that they're not going to come buy the game. I have issues with that argument in general, but it is also uh, a great reminder that all of it is, is built on no one pushing it too hard. And I think we're probably coming to a time when that will be under fire, where one of these cases will go in front of a court and someone will have to decide whether or not me picking up a controller and playing a game is transformative and uh, free expression and the creation of a new work. But right now, it all works because no one is, is willing to, to push it there. Uh, and for me, that's fascinating because for Twitch specifically, they need this threshold space to remain negotiated. They need this threshold to, to continue to grow and expand for more people to go from player to spectator, from spectator to streamer, from streamer to marketer. Because as long as they keep doing that, then the companies have no incentive to come in and shut it down. But the second that, that those people, that it becomes a little more standardized, a little more stable, then the, the people on the outside have more reason to shut it down, which you can imagine things like a unionization of streamers the 1.9 million people who stream but are not allowed to monetize their streams on Twitch, deciding to strike, all sorts of things like that that would risk and destabilize the, the current like precarious uh, middle ground here are things that I'm, I can't wait to happen, frankly. Be not because I hate the whole thing. Again, like this is somehow it became my career, um, but because I want us to, to not be in this precarious middle ground where the, the, the threshold space is benefiting only Twitch and a handful of people. Uh, I think that's going to be my time. Hello. Um, I think we're going to cross another threshold here. I'm sorry, Austin. Oh, but I think I'm going to oh, take the... Um, the, the prize for shittiest PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> In part because I didn't even use PowerPoint. So, uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, anyway, my name is Mike. Hi. I'll try and keep this short because we're almost out of time, and um, I'm sure people have a lot to say and not just, you know, wanting to listen to us. Why the hell is it mess? Yeah, good luck there. I got it. Um, anyway, so as Jeremy. Um, kind of alluded to, uh, I'm going to be talking about sort of ways we can get out of play, you know, ways we can escape this threshold space, and sort of like similar to what Austin was saying, this sort of spilling over of games into everything that isn't a game, this gradual claiming of territory um, that I think is fundamentally connected to our assumption that, you know, play now is, is synecdochal with computers. There is no play outside of a computer. Um, so uh, the, the idea originally occurred to me um, six or seven years ago. I was doing a story on the beginning of the decline of the um, subscriber base on World of Warcraft. Oh, here we go. Um, and I met a researcher from UC Irvine whose name I totally forget um, in another brazen... Um, display of bad journalism. <laughs> but um, he mentioned that in part of his research he had found a bunch of gambling sites in Europe, online gambling sites, that um, recognized sort of the benefits of placing hard limits on how much time their users could spend every day. And they found, because you know the nature of gambling itself was to become addictive and sort of self-destructive, 
Um, they would get a lot of people that would just, you know, blow their wad within a month and be so devastated by how much money they had lost that they would never come back again. And so what they developed was this um, tactic of, you know, the longer uh, a person was on in a single session, uh, they would lower the amount that they would be able to bet so that, you know, after three, four hours, they would be betting such small stakes that it was no longer sort of thrilling or worth their time to continue playing. And so, you know, it would kind of kick them out of the session, but it would leave them much more likely to come back tomorrow and the next day and the day after that, which is where the, the companies were making their optimal amount of money. Um, I don't know why I can't do this. Um, so anyway, Let's see here. Uh, there we go. So I started thinking about how this applies to video games because there's so much rhetoric about tutorials and sort of gaming people's brains uh, through these sort of onboarding rituals of you know teaching them how to use this tool and that tool and teaching them how to read the map and like what kinds of quests to expect in a game or sort of you know, what the parameters of the movement system are and, like, how do you communicate that. Um, and that's become kind of, like, a really well-developed science at this point. Um, in, in, well, I guess I can't open my PowerPoint at all. Anyway, you'll just have to listen to me talk. Then. Um, but there, there isn't any sort of, like, obvious way in game design that sort of, you know, where video games kick players out or begin a sort of a deceleration of the brain or sort of a preparatory sort of, you know, uh, ritual for, for returning to whatever, you know, life it is that you're sort of returning to once you're done playing. Um, and I sort of noticed this playing 1-2 Switch for the Nintendo Switch a couple of weeks ago. Um, and Nintendo is, you know, very famous over the last uh, decade or so for having these, like, stop playing windows. Usually, um, and sort of paradoxically, in their minigame collections where it's, it's least likely that you would want to spend eight hours playing 1-2 Switch. You wouldn't need a reminder of, okay, it's time to go outside now. You've been playing for 20 minutes. Like, the game is designed to sort of boot you after, you know, three minutes or five minutes. Um, you know, and they did this with Wii Sports, they did it with Wii uh, Fit, did it with Wii Play. Um, and it was sort of like anachronistic to see it again in 1 2 Switch. It was like, oh, they still do this stupid thing. Um, but then I switched over to Breath of the Wild, the new Zelda game, which is, you know, this monstrous hundred hour sort of like black hole of a game that like really does have no end point. Um, and it, it seems strange to me that, like, here is a style of game that would benefit much more from having a, look, stop playing. No one cares if you get another shrine. No one cares if you find another Korok seed. It's not going to change anything. Stop. Um, but those are the kinds of games that are least likely to have that, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, that's sort of, like, what got me thinking about this whole thing. And I started wondering, you know, and this is going to be, I, I don't want to be prescriptive here about what games should do to address this because, you know, that's tedious. But um, I do want to give a couple examples of uh, other types of activity that do have sort of like exit rituals or do have sort of a prolonged kind of tail to the experience, um, just in ways to sort of you know, inspire a kind of dialogue, maybe, or, you know. Uh, so, you know, as Jeremy mentioned, one of the first, uh, you know, maybe the best kind of examples comes from, you know, the idea of aftercare in BDSM, which is, like, as intense a sort of, like, you know, journey into a threshold space as, as maybe you can get. Um, and maybe here is sort of where we could have benefited from having a slide, but... Um, there, there is a, an explicit focus on, you know, long periods of time after, you know, you have uh, a BDSM encounter where, you know, and, and it's not singularly prescriptive about how to exit out of that. There are, you know, there are several different 
sort of tacts, and they're all sort of relative to the people engaged in the experience. But you know, these can include just sort of, um, you know, like massage, um, or even just like agreeing to have you know one of the persons or both of the people isolated for 10 to 20 minutes just so they can be alone and sort of like not have any further stimulation and just kind of process on their own terms or you know go through these explicit validation sort of rituals where one person just praises the other and sort of caresses the other um and you know i mean it would be nice if a video game did that i don't know if um if uh, anyone's played grid runners or um it's not it's it's the ios remake of grid runners that uh you know every time you pass a level it's like you're you know you are loved congratulations and it's like this you know 2d shooting game it's sort of like a galaga thing but every it just it it overwhelms you with sort of positive feedback um and then, you know, another sort of example of this is, is, you know, something I like to do, which is go to the Russian and Turkish spas here. And, you know, that's sort of both a singular activity in this great amorphous space where there's a bunch of, you know, kind of open places within the spa that aren't actually a spa, such as um, like a rooftop deck where people can just sit around and smoke and cool off in the outside and there's no point you might as well be on a park bench but relative to sort of the the basement chamber where all the really intense steam rooms are it's sort of like a release but you're not back out onto the sidewalk but you can kind of sort of you know get your bearings again and then choose to go back into the intensity of the heat or not there's a commercial space a cafe you can sort of order massages um, there are all these layers of experience that you know ultimately reinforce the idea that um, you know you're not bound to one sort of like singular dimension of an experience you can sort of actively cross through multiple thresholds multiple spaces and you know you can sort of put yourself in you know you can you can become a different sort of uh, I really don't want to say subject position, but that's the only word I can think of. <laughs> you can enter a different subject position, you can, like customer to conversationalist to, um, you know, just sweating sack of skin. Um, and that sort of, the absence of that, I think is sort of telling ultimately in a way, um, this will sort of be the wrap up here. Uh, I, I had this really long Baudrillard quote, which I guess you guys are going to be spared from having to hear. <laughs> um, but it it sort of ties back to the idea, uh, you know, that um, you know we are self-defeating in some ways by exclusively identifying play and exclusively thinking about games as bound to computers. And um, in the System of Objects, Baudrillard talks about how. You know, our, our belief in technology is sort of a, a progress-driven phenomenon. Uh, forces us as users to accept a certain kind of moral backwardness that the technology can measure its improvements against. So when we play games, I think there's a, a, a tremendous amount of unconscious pressure to sort of play down to them to sort of engage in decrepit behaviors, to sort of imagine yourself doing all manner of sort of immoral or abject things. And, you know, I mean, it's easy to say this with like shooting games or violent games like, you know, Call of Duty or God of War or whatever. But, you know, I mean, you could apply it to The Sims, you know, as, um, as we talked about, it definitely applies to SimCity. Uh, even stuff like Gone Home, which is essentially kind of like a a stalking simulator in a way you're just violating your younger sister's personal space like hacking uh, the code on her locker to read her personal diary and hear about her her earliest sexual experiences with you know no one else there you're just sort of like assuming you should have access to that I mean, it's really kind of like cryptic and, and uncomfortable um, but uh, yeah, that's it. Now I was I was gonna end with a bunch of pictures from uh, Sad Meverse of 
kids like crying for help on the meters, but I think you get the idea. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, that's basically, it. you know, games have an enormous amount of potential and power precisely because of their alterity and their ability to sort of allow us to sort of step out of things, but, you know, they lose all of that power if we don't think about how it is that we step back into something again once we're done with that, and uh, so deal with that. Thank you. <laughs> That was really nice and awesome. We have a few minutes here for questions. We've got about 15 before we start breaking for the uh, uh, time to eat for yourself before we have the keynote. Um, if anybody has any questions, are we? Well, I have a question. All right, well, that's awesome. Go for it. Um, hey, are these on? Are these on? It sounds like it's on. Okay, good. Uh, so for me, there's like a really great through line here, which is for me, if you think about Stephanie's notion of ca uh, players casting their own magic circles, determining their own subject positions in a sense, and their own their own expectations, their own uh, you know trying to find the the circle with the right amount of pores, the right type of pores. Um, that vision of this all suggests a great deal of agency in the player, right? It, it emboldens us. It, it says like, hey, you have this power. Go do this thing. Um, but what I when I think at when I look at uh, Naomi's talk at, at, and Mike's and my own, we're all very interested in the other thing, which is like, who is designing the circle that is cast? In what way uh, is there a restriction in place, uh, et cetera? And I'm kind of curious for you, how do you see either players resisting those restrictions or just in general like maintaining their status as as first movers, right, as primary agents here? I don't know if they, I don't know if those work, but don't worry, just project loud. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I just think you have a nice we'll one. Just talk. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, an example that uh, is pretty easy for me to go to because I just presented uh, it at the Society for Cinema and Media Studies uh, a couple weeks ago um, is Bloodborne. So the Dark Souls series has traditionally been critiqued as being this masculine power fantasy, like designed as um, a, a, a game that like underpowers you, but then always promises that you're able to like go out and conquer things. Um, so it's it, like I said, been critiqued as this like very masculine kind of design, um, with some you know pretty misogynistic imagery in it too. Um, so I argued that I played Bloodborne as uh, you know from my subject position um, as a woman living in patriarchy. Uh, I played. Bloodborne as an opportunity to destroy patriarchy. Uh, I saw it as an inversion of uh, the trope of hysterical women. Uh, so I noticed that a lot of the women that were represented in the game um, were uh, some of the still uh, like living characters, while the men in the world um, who had been part of these like knowledge-making institutions um, had become beasts. So I saw it as this opportunity for me. Um, a woman player playing as a woman avatar to just go destroy the system that they had made. Um, so I, uh, e even like moving around within this, this uh, very masculine system, saw it as an opportunity for me to create uh, a very different understanding of femininity, a different understanding of uh, violence, um, and uh, a different way of uh, interacting with that world um, where I had agency as a player and agency to then uh, determine what that game and what my play meant in that space. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I, my, my thing there is just like so much when I, you know, I guess the, the my follow-up there is Mike's point was that, or not point, but, but one of the things that you were kind of hoping for uh, is a world in which games help us to move from active player into the second, the second mode where we're de -engage, disengaging slowly and comfortably, or, or maybe sometimes in an interesting way, not so slowly, but are, they're, they're disengaging us or something, right? Like to play with that disengagement. Um, and for me, there's a, the, the, to connect it back to what you just said, I would love Bloodborne to do what you did, what you found yourself doing for players who might not have the lexicon and the, the notion that they can do that to the game. Right? Like, uh, are there examples of games that you think do that? That like guide the player from what is uh, a, a subject position that is in uh, just in my fucking head now. Like, you said subject <laughs> position, I can't get it out. Um, yeah, but say it I know, I know. You didn't invent it, yeah. Uh, so, so you know, in, in many games, you go into it. You know, there, there's probably a reading of Call of Duty that is that is uh, oppositional, also. But Call of Duty does not pre present you with that thing. It, it takes a, a great deal of work to produce that that oppositional 
perspective. Is there, is there, are there any games that come to mind for any of you that help create that new identity in the course of play? I would have to think about that. Like, I don't, I don't have any games off the top of my head, but of course, as soon as I stop talking, right, I think of, of something. But um, I, I've been thinking about that a lot lately because, like, I do a lot of resistant readings for, for the horror games that I'm studying. And resistant readings are great and, and fun, um, but after a while, yeah, it does kind of get tiring to constantly be in that position of having to resist and not just having a design system that lets me, you know, do those things without having to, like, insert myself in ways that um, I'm not assumed to be there in the game already. Totally. There was a hand. It looked like it had um, an answer. What about Undertale, then? Sure. I think Undertale... Maybe? Maybe. Uh, so I think that one of the things that we're getting at here is that games are, are purportedly all about players' agency, right? Like, oh, we're going to give you all of these things to do and choose from, but that's also uh, masks all of the other agency that the player has to like engage in a resistant reading or to stop right. playing. Like, you could do all of these things. You could play it in a way that's uh, explicitly forbidden to like step outside of the bounds. You could hack the game and so forth, right? So Undertale is, is kind of getting at this idea of, oh, the relationship between player and game is complicated, but it actually just inscribes uh, another boundary that's maybe a little bit further out and sort of does a little bit of a... I think of it as a little bit of a wink and a nod. It's lamp shading. It's uh, lamp shading this whole concept, right? Like, oh my gosh, don't you realize you're just playing a game? It's become a theme uh, over the last decade more and more. But but hanging a lamp shade on that weirdness is doesn't actually change it. I don't and I don't know how much it uh, it bursts the bubble of we're gonna you're gonna have the agency that we give you and don't think about anything else because you know we we want you to be in, inside of this right. veil. This might be a question that does not have an easy answer in that any game that presents you with an oppositional perspective is at once bring, recapturing you into right, its own. Right, that's right. Uh, the, so. the closest example I can think of are games that are doing this on the level of rules but don't necessarily engage with like the fiction, like we're talking about the fiction of Bloodborne. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite is probably a, a game called Crypt by Michael Bro. Yeah. Uh, that game yeah, l appears to be an ordinary puzzle game with challenges to solve, there's a lot of logic involved, but when you get past the halfway point uh, in the game, you realize that you now, in order to solve the problems, you have to start breaking the game. And in fact, the, the game kind of invites you to destroy it. Uh, and you can, you can easily, by using the, uh, the over uh, agency that you now are, are presented with by the game, you can uh, render it completely unplayable for yourself. You can wreck the entire thing. Uh, so that, that was a, a sort of a statement that I think goes beyond this problem that you're mentioning. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a paradox to this, too, because all games essentially put you in the same exact role, which is just player, and that, you know, to sort of torture you with Baudrillard again, it, he makes this point about the way that people speak about driving cars, where, you know, the function the car is performing, which is accelerating, it's, it's now, you know, described as the action the person is doing. I was speeding down the highway when it's like no you were in the car and the car was speeding by virtue of the, the engine but you just sort of take on the properties but like you actually have very little to do with how that thing is functioning and you know that's sort of like one of the great traps is that we think we're doing all these things but in reality we're just sort of returning again and again and again to this posture here and you know that's sort of you know, innate in a way, you just sort of have to accept that. Like, there, there's a way in which that circle just can't be squared. And that's sort of part of the pleasure of games, that you allow yourself to kind of break into hypocrisy for a few hours <laughs> or a few minutes or whatever. And that sort of, you know, is why games excel at abjection and decrepitude and, like, moral degeneracy, because that's sort of, like, that's the part of us that resonates most with that system and sort of, like, amplifies a sort of like ironic detachment we have. Not the sarcastic detachment of like, oh, I know what I'm doing, but like the ironic detachment of I'm not doing anything, and here I am imagining everything is happening just by virtue of my whim. Um, you know, and that's sort of, you know, I mean, that, that resonates to me a lot with like the, the Twitch business model, which is sort of, in a system like that, then it, the the differentiator is no longer the game, but right. it's the player, right? Right. The the imagined subjectivity is every single player brings to 
you know, there's a hundred ways to play Call of Duty because there's a hundred people that can play Call of Duty. It'll be angry grandma, or it can be, you know, Foucault postgraduate student, or it can be like, you know, military guy in like Afghanistan on like downtime or whatever. It could be a cop, or it could be an ex-prisoner. You know, there are a million different resonances within that, and so then we begin to consume those, and the game becomes sort of like backgrounded. Right. Well, and for me, there's a flattening of those of those different identities. To hey, do you have enough viewers that we could give you Twitch partnership so that you can then monetize this and sell games directly? Are you you're an okay inmate who plays or you know, former inmate who plays Call of Duty? What do your numbers look like? Mm -hmm. Like that to me is what is like closing down the different pr possibilities and in, more than closing it down is pressuring players who play on Twitch, who stream on Twitch and, and other streaming platforms to become like one sort of streamer, right? When I, when I speak to the people there and I say, hey, what does a successful streamer look like? Their answer is someone who streams six days a week, 10 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what that looks like. And they don't say, you know, and they say someone who engages with the community or something like that, but they don't, they don't talk about styles of play. They don't say people who are incredibly skillful or people who are really funny or it's all about like output numbers. It's you have to do it constantly, and if you do it, con if you don't do it constantly, you'll never do it. Um, which to me is like okay, that becomes for the sort of person who wants to be successful, a successful streamer. That's their their identity that they're they're aspiring to to step into. Um, there was another question straight back. It looked like I'm pointing you no know, oh, hand okay. down. Okay. Yeah, if you got a question, just get up and just project. Hmm? Um, Hi, um, really enjoyed all of your favorite, all of your talks. That was great work. Um, Stephanie, you said specifically that you didn't want to try to uh, place in a historical context the notion of magic circles and witchcraft. But uh, again, there's this interesting through line through all of your work that talks about the marking out of spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, all of you, in fact, would you might be able to get something from uh, actually taking a look at ritual studies, uh, taking a look at the work of um, Catherine Bell or uh, Ronald Grimes or Jay Z Smith. Um, their readings and ritual uh, for Ronald Grimes and uh, Jay Z Smith's to take place specifically talks about this idea of crafting space and the notion of what we invest in liminality, this porousness of uh, the real world or the secular world versus the space that we create and how each of our identities invest the space that we create with a certain type of sacrality or a certain type of uh, way of existing and the way of thinking within that moment that literally changes what we can do, what we can create, what we can make within that space. So I think um, taking a look at some of those things might be uh, interesting in terms of like what that means for community building, what that means in terms of how do we uh, deal with the notion of the real, what do we do with the idea of uh, how does this space as created mean something different now than it otherwise would, for instance, um, between you and me if we're not in the sacred space. Um, in some instances, being within the sacred space changes the roles that we have and the relationship that we have toward each other. So that kind of blending, I think, might be fruitful. Totally. I just want to shout out uh, an academic, uh, Karen Gregory, who's done a lot of work <laughs> Karen and I are very well. Right, right. <laughs> on, on specifically the, pro the professionalization of mm -hmm. kind of occultism, uh, the, how do you go from the woman who has a fortune telling business yes. uh, to the woman who has a fortune telling business that connects to all of her clients who are all white women on Facebook? Right. Like, how do, you, how do you go from, oh, you're not allowed to talk to her, she knows weird, she's not like a normal person, to like pop. Pop occultism, pop mysticism that like has a a, a really consumer driven audience. I think that notion of like she wanted those those are people who want to keep that that magic circle that that ritual space open, but also figure out how to sell it. And in the no, in the nature of doing that, need to sand off some of the edges. I'm mixing metaphors, but but yeah, I think we probably have one more. We have time for one more question. Go for it. Yeah, I'm interested in. Um, I mean, I think that again to expand the metaphor of the magic circle out to encompass the totality of the gaming industry itself and including all of its like tangential parts and independent circles. I mean there's also there's there's the fact of the matter that like 
you know, you could present it as the gaming industry is existing within a magic circle and the exterior of that magic circle that can't be escaped is the capitalist system under that underrides everything within it. And so I guess like in, in an idea of um, both the ideological engagements and disengagements that are allowed to occur within players, there's also that question of like, how does resistance to larger political systems function within like a context of a gaming industry, whether it can be an area that like that is allowed to play out within like the safety of like a microcosmic ideological space, or whether it's like ultimately a like feudal fantasy that like cannot actually like in any realistic terms confront the larger like external of the magic circle of like games as they stand. And I'm interested in responses to that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think this could tie into what um, the other gentleman was talking about with sacred spaces, yeah. but like, I mean, I think a lot about the way that sort of like hacking and cheaters are policed, especially with like Valve's anti-cheat, or like, you know, this, it was a couple of years ago, it still just pisses me off to think about, but like Blizzard prosecuted two college kids for running this Diablo 3 hack where they would using the chat interface online, go up, s say, hey man, here, can we, I forget what they're doing, they're like recruiting or offering to trade items, like rare items, and they would send a link through the chat, the other player would hit the link on the chat, and it would start this auto script that would just scrape their, the other player's like rare items and deposit it into uh, the hackers, and you know, there's kids goofing off or whatever, but like, playing within the bounds of what is possible in the software, right? Outside the bounds of the game, but still a playful, kind of like trollish act within. But it disrupts a sort of like productive mechanism for Blizzard. It sort of makes that space unsafe for, not for play, but for consumption. Now that it becomes an unsafe consumer good, but still maybe an interesting sort of playful, kind of like wild space. And these kids got sent up, they both got convicted of felonies. And you know, Blizzard cooperated with the FBI in this investigation to do like a sting on them, and for they wound up having to pay six thousand dollars, which was the the worth. Uh, this was when they were still trying to do the marketplace in Diablo Three, the real money marketplace, mm -hmm. and so they had to pay back the value of all the items that they had um, sort of hacked out of other people's, and that's doubly kind of damning because those items are just code on the the game that everyone owns, whether it's a disc or just like the executable, like nothing actually was taken from anyone. So it's just sort of like Blizzard can just unlock those items again for the people. Like, there's no, but it, it was still like assigned this real punitive kind of value. So I think that, you know, the, there's, there's a real heavy and sort of like frighteningly, not frightening, because it's just sort of like, you know, it, it's a, a miniaturized version of the same kind of like parochial enforcements that are ultimately about property and money right. that sort of these play structures just inside computers can kind of like exist in. And um, I think Toby's done. <laughs> <laughs> well, like the, the slightly more hopeful thing for me is like the autonomous position of like, yeah, if that happens, it's going to happen in Indonesia from people we have no idea about right now, from people who exist at the margins of the system that is trying to, to bring them into order but like someone else that would not be on this stage is, is where that's gonna bubble up, right? Like, so look to the margins always and like support the people who you see doing that sort of stuff if you can even see them, right? Because they're not going to be on your Twitter feed probably. Um, but yeah, I don't know, a little bit of hope. Only a god can say this, right? <laughs> that's what I had to A little or not. Yeah. I, re I really hate to cut this off. It's been a really great discussion. We are approaching the time for break for food. I'm going to remind everybody the keynote does begin at 6 o'clock. If you do show up early, please move to the middle of the rows, kind of like we did here, because we want to have people that come in later have the ability to seat and watch the keynote. So let's give a round of applause for our panel today. They were awesome. Thank you.